Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm Neil Chase. I'm the CEO at Cal Matters, the nonprofit news organization based in Sacramento and all over the state covering California policy and politics. And uh, we are doing this webinar conversation today with the group of folks who are here in the room and as a uh, a tool that will be available to libraries and schools all over the state for your use in uh, engaging with your communities and sharing some of the information with them. We have this Cal Matters for Learning package, courtesy of our friends at the California State Library. The California State Library team has, has made this available, uh, made it possible to do this. And I put the link there in the chat. It's calmatters.org slash for learning, where you can get these packages of handouts and background information and tools that you can use for conducting conversations in a community, uh, sharing materials in a library, in a school, in, in a community center, um, creating conversations and activities among people who want to talk about these topics. And our topic for today is electric vehicles, which are taking California by storm and creating great change across the state and also raising a lot of questions about whether we can actually be a place that has a bunch of electric cars and, and, and keep the whole thing running. And uh, our, our partner for this conversation today is Julie Cart. Julie has been covering environmental issues across California and the West for a few years now. Uh, Julie uh, spent uh, a good number of years at the Los Angeles Times covering environmental issues, uh, was part of a team that won a Pulitzer Prize for coverage of wildfires in the West. Julie, like many wonderful accomplished journalists, started as a sports writer and uh, if you can cover a sports event and file a story within minutes of the sport event ending, you can you can do anything in journalism. And uh, she has proven that by becoming one of the uh, certainly best environmental reporters on the on the West Coast and in the country and a great uh, asset to our team at Cal Matters. So Julie, welcome. Good to have you here. Really good to be with you, Neil, and always happy to be around librarians. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, we've we've come to learn through this project that uh, how much people rely on their libraries for information about everything, but especially about things that intersect with the government, with elections, with the policies and things that are so important to, to everyday people, everyday lives. And this one's an interesting topic, right? Because there are a lot of electric vehicles in California. There are a lot of vehicles in California that don't run on electricity. And there are a lot of people who still can't afford an electric vehicle or could don't have access to a charger for an electric vehicle or for one of you know many, many reasons. Uh, it's it's hard to fathom a state being all electric, but in fact, that's what the what the, what the state's trying to do, right? Let me ask you to ex explain the the policies that are that are pushing us toward being an all electric uh, car state. Well, it push is one way to say it. Uh, it's a it's a hard shove in a very difficult but important direction. And and the point of electric vehicles is not. Uh, to be green for green sake or uh, virtuous, it is to help California meet its goals of zero carbon emissions from any source at all, electrify the state. And the, the underpinning of that is, of course, climate change and to try to mitigate as we can and then adapt to it. But also, it's important to think about electric vehicles in terms of public health and they, when there is a reduction of tailpipe emissions, there is a dramatic drop in asthma, heart and lung ailments, and lots of other illnesses. And those things particularly hit it lower income communities and people who uh, live near uh, power plants and things like that. So that's the underpinning of it. Um, we have a very long way to go, 35% uh, <laughs> electric vehicles uh, it, by uh, 2025 and then 100% by 35. And, and that's for new car sales. And just to make that clear, people will scream like my brother, you take my uh, internal combustion engine from my cold dead hands. That's not what the state intends. You may not buy, they may not sell new cars in, 19, in 2035. You can go somewhere else and buy it. It's a pretty alarming loophole that will probably adjust, ad, adapted at some time, but at that, so that's what, that's the intent, new right. cars. And so, and obviously you can drive around the streets of California and see a lot of cars that are very old. And so there will be gasoline cars forever, but at some point they're gonna have to be fewer gas stations, right? If people are buying less gas and it's gonna be 
less ubiquitous. Right now, you can get gas pretty much anywhere and feel comfortable that you're going to be able to get around, and you can't necessarily get that electric charge. So are, are we headed for a situation where there'll be an electric charger on every corner, and if you're the last person with a gas car, you got to search for a gas station? Well, the really smart gas station companies that own a number of them are converting and having uh, making available chargers. And the thing that's interesting about it uh, you know, show me a policy, I'll show, show you an entrepreneur who's going to capitalize on it. And that's a good thing. They realize, you know, you may spend, might spend five or 10 minutes to, to get gas. If there's a pump available, you might run in to get something to drink or use the restroom. But when you're charging, you're there for 30, 40 minutes, an hour, depending on, on your needs. So there are now more expansive gas stations. We're gonna be writing about this at Cal Matters that are designed for people to hang around. So there'll be food courts, there'll be playgrounds for kids. Um, there are some designs that show uh, yoga studios. I mean, it, it's, it's California, you just use your imagination, but gas stations aren't gonna go away. Um, and some will be exclusively for gasoline, but they're, look for an expansion in terms of commercial uh, options of, of chargers. Uh, to give you an idea where we have to go, I think there's about 80,000 public chargers now. And by 2030, so just in a few years, um, the state needs more than 1.2 million. So we have a really, really long way to go. And that would address one of the big uh, barriers for the adoption other than cost of electric vehicles, which is range anxiety. I'm gonna run out of power and I'm gonna be stuck. And oh my God, what am I gonna do? Some guy can't show up from AAA with a, a gas can in his hand. So that is the charging infrastructure and the build out of that is absolutely critical and it's pretty far behind. Yeah, yeah. Let me go back to something you referred to a little bit ago, the health issues. There's actually pretty clear data that people living along some of the highways in California, if you live close to Highway 99, I'm doing this from Fresno today, right? If you live along Highway 99, what, what, are, the, what are the risks to, to your health, to your kids' health of being that close to all those trucks and cars? Uh, as a Southern Californian, it, it, that happens to the port of Long Beach, which is the, the, where a lot of the big container ships come in and there's this backup of, of diesel trucks, diesel particularly uh, nasty business because it has a high particulate. So sometimes it's just stinky stuff in the air, but with diesel and some of the other emissions they are actually little small particulates that get in your lungs and then they're quite pernicious. So if you live along 99 or the, the 710 freeway or anywhere there's idling trucks in particular, um, or just whoosh of, of vehicles. Um, you have uh, cancer clusters, and that's not, you know, pie in the sky. It's not conspiracy theory. You have uh, kids with uh, who who have no other indicators, who who suddenly have asthma, respiratory problems, heart lung illnesses. Uh, it's it's quite nasty, and they and if when when the autopsies are made for whatever reason of some people who die in those areas, when they they do cellular analysis, the 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 body burden of heavy metals and other things that coming become clear. So it's actually very it's not healthy to live there. And so guess who lives there? You know, low income folks uh, who can't afford to go anywhere else. Right, and so this is. This is addressing a lot of issues at once. Uh, as long as we're talking about health and you mentioned heavy metals, the, the, the batteries needed for these cars are, we're, we're, we're taking the, the gasoline and diesel smog out of the air, but the batteries are not without their own impact on the environment, right? Yeah, we did a story on that. The batteries are nasty business, but if you had a lot of dough, this is where you wanna put it. Uh, the, the, the incredible goal rush uh, to find and mine and then make these batteries, the materials for the batteries is has been on for a long time. And to no one's great surprise, that market has been quartered by China, which, which manufactures 85% of the batteries themselves. They mine the materials. And the, the, there have been a lot of changes that we can talk about if you want, Neil, about the incentive programs that the state and federal governments have that are attempting to, um, steer consumers and manufacturers away from obtaining batteries from conflict countries, meaning there are, there are places where the uh, cobalt, which is coming from parts of Africa, where children are actually digging this, this mineral out with their hands, lithium that it, that's being mined in a, 
incredibly uh, environmentally invasive way and countries that we don't have, we're not on good terms with, we don't want to support in terms of their labor practices or environmental laws. So the, the big effort with batteries now is to find batteries that uh, materials that are a, a bit more environmentally friendly, make batteries not so nasty when the end of their life because they they leak and they do all kinds of bad things. It, it's kind of exciting what they plan for batteries. Um, it, it, with electric vehicles, the research says that they're, when people sell their electric vehicles, those batteries are put in trash heaps or you know, scrap yards with as much as 60 to 80% of their capacity still there. So it's called the second life. So they're trying to kind of aggregate. Right now, there's not enough of them because there haven't been enough electric vehicles retired, but they're, they're folks who are aggregating those batteries to make small scale battery storage or running the, the scrap yard and stuff like that. So the, the big push in the battery side of it to wrap, wrap this up is to find different materials uh, rather than lithium ion, which is the, the current battery uh, standard uh, materials and, and source them from partners like Australia uh, with the United States so that we can all feel a little bit better about the supply chain. Right. So let's from the supply of batteries, let's talk about the supply of electricity, right? We we have all been in situations in various parts of the state and seen other places in the country where during the worst hottest day of the summer, when all the air conditioning's running, and now in California, when the sun sets and the solar and the and the wind are no longer uh, generating power necessarily, um, can you know are we going to get to the point where it's like the days of the gas shortages if people are old enough to remember that, right? Where you just can't. There's not enough electricity to go around and now we're going to add all these electric cars. Can we actually handle these cars we're trying to encourage people to buy? Uh, we can. We have to, the state has to do an awful lot to make that happen. And, and the wonderful, horrible irony, uh, within less than a week after the Air Board uh, established its new uh, requirements for the number of electric cars that California will have to have, uh, it was in August last year and we had that horrible heat wave <laughs> and there was 10 days of brownouts and things like that, which gave us a, a kind of indicator of the future. Um, yes, they are going to pull on the grid. There are a couple things that can mitigate that. One is we've got to encourage people or the state wants to encourage people to use electric power to plug in not in peak hours. Peak is about four to nine when people come home and start plugging everything in and turning everything on. Charge during the day, charge an overnight. And if it's a home charger, it can be programmed to do that. Uh, so that's extremely important. It's pretty simple. It's pretty easy to, to get into that habit. The other thing is a thing called battery to grid or car to grid, which sounds like you know, space age, but people can actually, you plug in your car into maybe an outlet at your house uh, or a charging station at your house and the electricity goes into the car. That battery is quite significant and in aggregate represents quite a lot of battery storage. That, that electricity can go the other way. And when it's just sitting there, you're not using it and it's, you, you don't need it to be 100% capacity, you can charge your house or direct that power to the grid. And again, it, it's little drops, but it's better than nothing. And when you have, when you're thinking, envisioning a future with millions of electric cars, um, they're just little storage units running around. And there's, um, it's kind of exciting what might happen in that way. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating, right? Um, because we're talking about this for people who work in California libraries, uh, a couple of people when they were registering shared questions about libraries and charging at libraries, right? And the idea that um, if the library is the place you go for information, the library is the place you go for access to information, why wouldn't the place, the library be the place you go for power? And maybe this is for our friends at the state library to work on, but there are local and state government initiatives and, and ways to get charging into certain places, right? Well, I would argue there's always great power at libraries, but yes, talking about electric vehicles, the, the, what the state doesn't want is to see a system where electric vehicles are charged at people's homes. That excludes renters. It, ex, it excludes people who, who live in non-traditional dwellings, trailers, et cetera. So what the state wants to do is, is have a mix, a good mix, uh, 
shopping malls, big uh, workplaces, you know, uh, uh, office parks, apartments, so that there's a mix and where people are during the day. So that includes libraries. And there are lots of programs. Some of them are run by the state and some are run by counties that I don't like this word, I would never write it, incentivize that, that provide funding, materials, resources, if um, entities want to do that. I mean, they're, a commercial one would be about $7,000. So it's, it's accessible if an apartment and their uh, owner would like to do that. And there are incentives for those folks to do that. And we're probably gonna get to a point where you won't be allowed to build a housing, you know, let's say commercial um, apartments without providing that because that's seen as a necessity, just like parking spaces and other requirements. So uh, libraries will definitely fit in that mix. Um, it's gonna be interesting because you, there's all the etiquette of charging. You don't want someone, if you, it, it, you're a, a small library and you're, you're delighted and proud to have a charger and some schmo gets there, um, parks there all day while leafing through materials, that's not gonna help. And there's ways to, uh, there's way to ways to deal with that, but uh, even one charger is great, you know. Yeah, yeah, and then the uh, having an electric car myself, the etiquette and the conversations around it are always fascinating about uh, how long you can park at a charger and whether you whether it's okay to take out that space when you're not charging anymore and complaining about somebody who blocks it and there's a there's a whole level of conversation going on there, right? That that's going to become part of our conversations. Um, we talked a lot about cars. Talk, if you would, a little bit about the trucking industry, because that's obviously a source, as you said, a source, especially the sort the trucks around the ports, huge source of emissions, and another place where electrification can happen, right? It, it, it's it's happening right now, and there are state requirements to electrify uh, certain classes of of vehicles. It's slow because there's a smaller market and fewer manufacturers, but they're there. Uh, including Tesla, um, and it, it's a tough nut to crack. Uh, Californians may not really understand the, what a, a, a commodity highway California is. We, we bring stuff in from the ports in the south and the north, overland from Canada to Mexico, and that I-5 corridor is just, you know, it's busy. Uh, if you're in a small car, sometimes you get blown off the road. So we realize that, and they there is an effort, uh, a multi-state effort, and in, and in, in international, including Mexico, to electrify Interstate Five. There's some fascinating stuff. There are it, there are some test strips in 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 California uh, on highways now that your car will charge as you drive over basically uh, solar plates. And it, there's a way to to allow your battery to receive that. Um, they are going to. There's an effort to put in a, a special charging stations. You can imagine we talked about uh, gas stations or electric vehicle charging stations. What the the kind of space and design you would need to accommodate semi tractor trailers is a pretty big deal. But one of the things that, that that's being discussed is having. Um, I want to say laybys. That's not an American expression, but you pull off, and instead of charging, uh, which would take an enormous amount of time, they have bays where they would slide a new battery in. Yours would plug in, to, you know, and be charged for the next guy. And it, it's like indie, you know, it's like a pit crew, and then you drive out. Um, that is workable. It's it's it it can happen. Uh, somebody has to pay for that, and no doubt the state and taxpayers will incentivize those those companies. Um, a big problem for trucks is range because they do, you know they're not pulling over every ten minutes to charge. They are on the clock and wait. Batteries are extremely heavy, very very heavy, and uh, especially for drayage, you know, for that kind of freight. So there's a lot of things to fix and, but it's, it's gotten a lot of attention and everybody, that's a problem everyone wants to solve. Well, you know, you think about that future, right? Where, where cars are being charged by the highways they're driving on, where a fleet of trucks can just swap out batteries and keep going. Uh, you know, the way you stop for, for coffee on a, on a long drive, right? Um, it's it just, it shows you how much we're in the infancy of what this is actually going to look like. And the, the idea of a bunch of electric cars plugging into chargers on the, on the side of the road or at work or at the library is, is just an intermediate step to, to where we're actually going. 
Um, let's talk about money because obviously these things are very expensive now. They're generally more expensive than the same car if it runs on gas. And there have been these federal incentives, but they're a little confusing and that's probably putting it mildly, right? It's, it's a big tangled mess. So how, how, it's, as best you can, how do we explain the, the federal incentives, the, the money that's there to encourage people to buy electric cars and who actually benefits from that incentive? Who, who can use it? Yeah, I may not be the best untangler, but essentially both the state and the federal government and there are local incentives usually from, uh, sometimes it's from the county, but if people want to look into it, there's incentives for charging and also for swapping out old cars uh, from utilities and some of them are quite significant. You have to check county by, by county and by utility, but uh, so there's many layers. The federal one at the moment, and these are changing, um, is $7,500 for a new electric vehicle. And just uh, again, a little bit of a definition, an electric vehicle is a car or a vehicle that only runs on a battery. There's a plug-in electric vehicle, which is kind of a hybrid where it, it can run, it has, a, it has a battery and it can run on that battery for you know, maybe 20 miles, and then your your internal combustion engine kicks in, and none of that is to be confused with hybrids we know as Priuses and things like that. So electric vehicles, there's a $7,500 tax credit, so it's not a rebate, it's a tax credit. Everybody, just about everybody on this call would qualify for that because it's, uh, I, I think it's a combined family income of $300,000. Um, there, uh, a lot of these what are, these incentives are um, income based and need based, and they of course go higher uh, to as you go as you earn less money. So it's seventy five hundred dollars on the federal side, about two thousand on the state side. Um, there is a caveat now under the new Biden administration. Um, uh, I, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. There's all this money. But as we talked about the batteries, trying to, um, in an effort to A, get China out of the picture and, and lessen its reliance, our reliance, everyone's reliance on their batteries and their technology, and to boost um, local economies and, and the federal, the national economy, there are, uh, there's a sliding scale now. And certain manufacturers, uh, uh, Volkswagen, for example, Chevy, when their cars are uh, meet the qualifications for being either built or the parts in the United States or parts coming, um, the majority of the parts, more than 50% of the parts, including batteries uh, coming from domestic sources or trading partners. So Korea is a trading partner, for example, and they're a battery supplier, then you get the full credit. But if you go down the line, like Toyota, which is um, a very reluctant, uh, entry entrant into the electric vehicle market, um, their cars don't qualify. So just because it's an electric vehicle you, you're looking at, you really need to check. Uh, there's something called uh, greencars.com. There's, there's a number of web sources. Check the if it if that manufacturer if that car qualifies for these rebates and tax credits and the degree to which they do. And and also know that particularly on the state side there's a scale that slides upward, which is nice. So the less you make, the more you'll get. Hardly so the, untangled. <laughs> the less money you make, the lot larger amount you might be able to get back. Although of course, less money you make, the less position you're in to afford some of these cars, especially the more expensive ones. Although there are starting to be some, some less expensive versions now, right? Let me, um, let me invite the folks who are on the call with us live now. If you have any questions, please feel free to put up your hand or just unmute and, and holler out. We've uh, We've discussed so far some of the questions that the people shared with us when they registered and uh, wanted to make sure we, we got those surfaced as well. Um, any specific I questions? I did want to say, and if anyone yeah. wants to ask about this, there are incentives available for leasing cars and for buying used cars, used electric vehicles. And that's new, right? The idea that uh, there's enough out there now that you could buy a used car and that might make it more affordable. Right. Excellent. Any uh, questions from the folks who are on with us live? Okay, um, Julie, where where does our reporting go from here, right? What what stories would you and your team like to like to do next? What what are we going to be talking about in the next year or two about electric?
vehicles as the as the number of them grows, as the variety of them grows, as the as the usage grows, as we get closer to the the point where the state wants all new cars sold to be electric. Well, as far as reporting, Neil, I think I need to go to Hawaii to see what it's like to live on an island that's trying to fully electrify itself. But there you go. Uh, yeah, we're going to take uh, some road trips to test out in real time. Um, what it's like to get from point A to point B if you live in San Francisco or Los Angeles or some other larger cities, you know, it, it, it's really no trouble. You're going to stumble over these stations. But for a lot of Californians in, in far flung places, you're in Fresno, use your app and look around. You'll, it, it's not so easy. So we're going to check that, uh, you know, in, in real time in, in kind of the, the corners of the state, how people are, are, are navigating almost literally. The, and the other side to that is you, you may use an app or you just may know, look, there's, uh, you know, there's four charging stations at that Walmart. You arrive, the app told you that all the, all the, the charging bays were available, they're not or you get there and they're empty, but they're broken. So there is a lot of frustration um, in, in real life uh, navigating that. Um, we're definitely gonna look at everything in California is going to be electrified, all of transportation. And that means ports. There are already ports that run, on, uh, all of the service vehicles within the port it runs on electricity. One of the big problems are idling uh, diesel. The diesel that ship ship fuel is nasty, nasty. So they're trying to turn off those ships as they sit there, and the, all the cargo comes off, and they're running those. They're plugging into the port, so that helps an awful lot. That doesn't say that the ships themselves are electric, but that's a start. But believe it or not, there are electric planes, certainly electric trains. That's from the 19th century. Um, so everything is going to be electrified. And we need to look at that and um, track it. And as you said to start, where's this power coming from? And that means uh, uh, alongside of that, we'll be writing about all the renewable energy. I'm working on a project about offshore wind and you know what, how that fits into all this as we get as we turn off all the gas fired power plants and our nuclear plants so there's a big heavy lift are we going to start to see more wind farms off the off the coast of california you won't see them because they're going to be 20 miles off the coast um yes uh the the leases we already have leases in two areas uh out off morro bay and in off the humboldt coast humboldt county and there's a state lease that's uh in santa barbara um you're not going to see them soon. It, this is fascinating technology that's never been tried anywhere in the world. They're going to be floating. They'll be tethered to the floor. The, the feature of the California coast is it, it's shallow and then takes a big dive. So it's some of these things are at three, 4,000 feet. They'll be floating and they're farther out and deeper than any wind farms in the world. So it's a, it's a bit of a grand experiment. Wow. Wow. Nothing can go wrong with that. No, there's, I don't see any problems. There's a question from Laura uh, about the state limiting the number of charger stations in particular cities due to the capacity of the power grid. Is that, do we know, are there specific cities that are blocking people from putting in stations now? Or is that is the capacity of the grid more of a future worry as we get more stations? It's a future worry. I, I, I'm not aware of that, Laura, but uh, if you think about the grid, it, it's not run by a city. The grid is this humongous beast that's run by an agency uh, that's in Sacramento, that's independent. Um, so the power is the power. If a local utility said, we're concerned particularly about this issue of surge, everyone plugs in when they get home or everyone goes on their lunch hour and there's this, that, that's always the case, electric vehicles will exacerbate that. that might be an issue and and maybe they'll be thinking about um, putting some kind of uh, lock or some way to not allow the chargers to be used in, until certain times Sometimes, but I, yeah. don't, I don't I have not heard of that I'm not aware of that yeah yeah and then Melvin asks about hydrogen right we, we've we've heard about other kinds of fuels for cars there are hydrogen fuel cell cars driving around California right now not many and not many places to to fuel them up I was about to say gas them up but that I guess would be wrong um, where, where, where does that stand? The power of the future and always will be. Um, 
people are passionate about hydrogen uh, whose vehicle emissions are drops of water. Um, that it, it's, um, it's a fascinating, uh, I, I also wrote about that. People love those vehicles. They're not many. Uh, because there's uh, a part of it is a disinformation about if you hit a hydrogen car, it's going to explode. That's silly. That's not correct at all. Um, there is, there are sometimes supply chain problems. Uh, moving, transporting hydrogen is a little tricky, and storing it, um, particularly if there's not a huge demand. So they're they're caught in this kind of cycle. Um, one thing that really hit them hard was Toyota is actually interested in hydrogen and the, the Tokyo Olympics that were going to feature hydrogen buses and everybody who was going to be in Tokyo for the Olympics were going to get excited and be exposed to hydrogen uh, as a fuel, those Olympics were canceled because of uh, COVID. And that was a real big blow because that was seen in the industry across the industry as, as being a, a, a real platform or springboard and it didn't work out so well. Um, if you look at the incentive structure in the state, um, there are much healthier, larger incentives for buying hydrogen vehicles. And uh, I'm telling you, people really love them, but it's, it's, you are pretty limited in terms of, you know, on a, a very serious scale of where you're going to fuel it. Yeah, you need to, you need to usually live within range of the probably the place you bought it that is the one place you can get the hydrogen or a couple of places right Pretty much. yeah 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 well good thank you uh any last questions from uh from the folks who are here um we're going to make this available as part of the four learning package so that people can use it uh with all the other materials that are there and if you, if you go take a look at that calmatters.org for learning site uh calmatters.org slash for learning there are modules there about other california stories we'll be adding more to those as well uh, Julie, I want to thank you for taking the time today to, to share this and help us understand this better. And I want to thank our friends at the California State Library who made this entire, not only this webinar, but the entire four learning package available and are, are supporting the development of it and making this available to all the, the libraries and other folks in the state who are using it. So thanks very much to everybody for doing this. And we will uh, be back with another one of these in a few weeks. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.